It's Saturday, February 10th, 2024. I think I'm actually going to trim some plywood today. I didn't like the prospect of delaying this for another couple of weeks. And if I delay it two weeks, it'll likely delay three because I have a convention coming up. So that's going to take a few days of my time away from the wood shop. So here's what I constructed here this morning in a panic. <laughs> Not in a panic, but this is kind of best I can do at this point. I went out to my other building and I got my big uh, six horsepower, 16 gallon dirt hound shop vac. Shop vac is a brand, but hey, that's what it is, right? And I made a, a wooden adapter here for this fitting on my separator and uh, stuck the hose in there. So that fits nice and tight. That's going to stay in there. Now, the difference between a, a vacuum and a dust collector is a vacuum has more what they call static pressure. It'll, it'll actually suck more stuff, but it doesn't move as much air. So this doesn't work as well as I would like. Um, you know, maybe I should take this and crawl down under the table saw and hook it up there. Well, we'll run like this for a while and see what happens. See if we get any dust in the bucket. And uh, that's all I need to do is just keep the, the sawdust from building up in the table saw while I trim plywood. Now that I have the vacuum cleaner hooked up to the, the uh, table saw here, I do have some airflow, so hopefully it'll absorb the, the dust. I've run this one piece through already, so I'll explain to you what I'm doing. I'm running the, uh, I'm running the, uh, the factory edge along the, the fence. So uh, that green paint that I put on there, uh, so I'm running that along there and then the second time I'll either turn it around and run the f other factory edge or I'll just cut along the edge that I did already and this is my off cut. Um, I did the ladder on this one because this edge is not very nice. It's kind of scrappy so I'll set that aside. So these are cut. This is set at 22 inches and my pallets are 21 and three quarter overall. Uh, so I've got a couple options here. This this looks pretty good. This will be the back of a pallet. And then this side will be trimmed again once I'm done uh, assembling the pallet. Now these need to be trimmed to 33 and a half inches wide. Uh, but again, um, two things I want to do. I want to get rid of this green paint. I want to freshen that up with a nice nice raw cross cut but I also want to cut this side because this is the track saw cut and uh, it's not guaranteed to be guaranteed to be perfectly straight etc so my second time through I'll run the factory green paint edge through the saw this way at you know what did I say 33 and a half I'll run at 33 and 5 8 and then I'll flip it around and uh, trim trim this. I don't need to take much off of that to just clean it up. So if you understand all that, then you're in good shape because I didn't. But because I don't have a helper, I just have to do a bunch of these, set them aside, and then change gears and do that second trim that I talked about um, so that I can finish them off. Then I get to palletize them, stick them in the shed until uh, until it's time to assemble. Because I'm having trouble with the edges of this plywood, I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to make it so I can take off the maximum amount at trim time. And what that means is cutting this stuff 
at 24, in, uh, 24 inches. And then what that means is that factory edge that ends up at the front of the pallet, I'll have the most waste come off of that. Good news is it won't create any off cuts right now. I'm just cutting these in half. Well, there's no sawdust build up, so I guess the vacuum is doing the trick. Wouldn't that be something if I didn't have to go through all the bother with the dust collector, just use the vacuum. Well, that's about a third of them. And uh, I'm going to finish these today. I'm kind of played out, but I'll rest for a few minutes. And then I'll do another third get them processed and then they're ready ready for assembly so they'll wait quite some time and uh i have to i have to even buy the two by fours and the one by eight still so that's why i'm kind of concentrating on the plywood at this point um this was uh, uh you may have seen my earlier video this is a d-grade plywood that i picked up Kind of hoping that it was uh, good enough for beekeeping equipment, and, and I will say it is. However, um, it's uh, I'd say it's just barely good enough. There's going to be a lot of culling. There's going to be a lot of cutting around bad spots. So it's not my favorite thing, but. With the price of plywood these days, I'm kind of forced into it to be honest. I'm trying to keep the trying to keep the price down for the customer without compromising the finished product. And I hope the finished product is is as good as as he's come to expect. Uh, so we'll see, right? Anyway, I'll leave you with that for today, and I'm going to keep at this. Thanks for watching. It's Sunday, February 11, 2024. So I got a, a lot of plywood uh, prepared yesterday, cut up into uh, final size, pre-assembly pre size, uh, because as you may know, I always trim everything at the end. But uh, I got 80 of the pallet plywood sections complete. They're sitting here just off camera. I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, so I have... Uh, 80 about I think about 30 30 or 40 left I suppose um, but <laughs> this dust collection thing is a, a never-ending saga so yesterday I decided you know I've got to get some work done I can't just leave it sit so I went to my other building I got my shop vac and I hooked it up here and that were actually worked really well but there was a wrinkle and I'll move the camera over here and I'll show you the wrinkle. So I've got my shop vac hose here going into my four inch uh, pipe that goes to the table. So I had to make a, a wooden reducer here, uh, which took me quite a while and nothing ever fits just right. I had to use a lot of that aluminum tape and whatnot. So it kind of worked, except uh, when I was done cutting all the plywood that I cut for the day, I came back over here to, uh, you know, revel in my success with this, and here's what I found. I came over here to see that there was dust everywhere, and I kind of thought, well, why is there dust everywhere? Well, because there's no filter in a shop vac. <laughs> <laughs> so the shop vac has a bunch of uh, larger particles in it, which is great, but the dust that I really need to collect um, is all over the floor and everywhere. So that didn't work out so well. 
And then also when I was done with this, uh, my brain started thinking a little more, and I don't know why I didn't think about this sooner. Even though I don't have the fittings and whatnot to use my Cyclone uh, yet, what I did have was I had a, a six inch to four inch reducer. What I can do, reduce to four inch and take this nice long piece of flex hose, just stretch it over here to the table saw. Uh, so of course, you know, if I'm gonna do this and then I have to take this and put that five inch hose in here, install the filter. I think I'll go with the filter again for now and the bag and then everything is going to go in the bag which is okay you know at least i get my dust collector working and then i can put the cyclone in it now that it's set up uh, when i get the fittings and whatnot to connect that up so actually what i may just do is i'll just hook this up like it was before here's my garbage can separator i can stick this sucker right there bob's your uncle yeah, sometimes it just takes a fresh set of eyes to see <laughs> the short-term solution. Get so focused on the final product and then, you know, coming up with something that's kind of mid midstream uh, sometimes is not as easy to see, but this will work just fine. I'll get that all put together and I'll be back in business with the table saw for the, in the meantime when I get the fittings for this big thing. And uh, then I can put that up in there. There's been a lot of discussion on my channel about this. I really appreciate the engagement. Uh, thanks for watching my videos, first of all. And uh, I really appreciate the suggestions, the comments. Uh, there's been people uh, saying that they, they use the same Cyclone system and et cetera. They've set up similar systems and have told me how they like that and how, how well it's worked for them. And the consensus seems to be that overall, in general, I'm going in the right direction here. Um, one of the things that seems to be controversial and that uh, I, I don't seem to be able to explain very well um, because it's not my primary area of expertise, I guess, is that there's been some adamant discussion that I'm doing this wrong and I need to vent this outside. And uh, I, I would like nothing more than to vent this outside. I would love to vent this outside. Uh, the problem is that's impossible. Not impossible. Nothing's impossible. It's impractical. And some of it's almost impossible, but most of it's very impractical. And here's the reasoning. In, in HVAC, in, in air movement, air handling systems, you cannot move air out of a building or into a building without uh, either incoming makeup air or exhaust air, okay? It, it's, a, it's a fixed size building, it's not a balloon, right? So if you're trying to pump air into the building, you need that air to go somewhere. You need to allow the air to escape somewhere else. Often air escapes in a building just in the cracks, right? And it really depends on how, how well your building is built and how old it might be, doors and windows and ceilings and all kinds of stuff they all leak uh, this building's pretty tight i built this building and it's it's pretty darn tight uh it's so tight actually i have an exhaust fan in here just to keep some ventilation going out uh, but again you know that exhaust fan blows air out but where does it get that air the air has to come into the building so any air that the exhaust fan moves out of the building has to come into the building somewhere else usually cracks in the doors and the doors are the worst right the air will come in around the doors generally as a first first line so here's the math this building contains about 9,000 cubic feet of air all right it's a 900 cubic foot building it's 10 foot walls and so the the math is easy there um so there's 9,000 cubic feet of air in this building. This blower is rated 1,200 CFM. Now that's uh, unladen capacity. That is, you remove this hose, you let a six inch to a five inch, turn the blower on, that's what you're gonna get. 
Uh, we all know that that's not what's going to happen when you've got the whole thing connected, especially with one outlet. However, uh, even though I don't own an anemometer to calculate and to measure that and calculate it, um, I've done enough research looking at what people use. Uh, and they use this blower exactly, and they have done those calculations. And guys are seeing uh, 600 to 800 uh, CFM in their system as it's operating. So if we said 600 CFM, that's half of what this blower is uh, rated at. If you do that math, that's 15 minutes. This blower will exchange the air in this building in 15 minutes at 600 CFM. Okay, so if I'm pumping air out of this building at 600 CFM and I have the capacity of 600 CFM make up air coming into the building and I have to build that in. I, I can't just depend on doors and windows leaking, particularly because this building is pretty tight. It's a fairly new building and I built it. I know how tight it is. Uh, that's going to suck air down my chimney. It's going to suck air backwards through my existing exhaust fan. It's going to try and suck air through the cracks in the doors. Um, that's not going to amount to 600 CFM, let alone 1,200. Uh, so I'm going to have to build that in. I'm going to have to build in ventilation, just like my bee barn. I exhaust air from my bee barn. I need that air to come from somewhere, comes from across the room. So if I build in that ventilation and it's minus 40 outside and I work in here for an hour with that dust collector running, that's going to exchange the air in this building four times in that hour. It's going to be so cold in here, I'm not going to want to be in here. Okay, And it's going to be cold enough in here that even the things in here that shouldn't freeze might start to get too cold. So you say, well, there's got to be a solution. There is, but that is also not a good solution. And the solution is duct in, a, 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 let's say 600 CFM. It won't be quite 600 CFM, but, but you've always got losses. So let's say 600 from outside into the cabinet of my table saw, right? So the air from outside goes into the table saw, collects the, the sawdust and goes down the hole. That's not even going to work very well because a lot of the sawdust that collects uh, kind of comes from the, the leading edge of the blade. So it has to suck air down, which in that case, it's not going to be doing that. Um, now that's not practical because now I'm going to have condensation and icing issues in my table saw because it's, it's humid in here. It's warm uh, space. And although it's not humid like your kitchen, you're cooking and boiling things and making humidity, it's still as humid because I have, I have wood and, and other things in here that's been outside and they come in here and they dry. Well, where does it, where does the water go? What goes in the air? You cool that air and then you start to get condensation and icing. Um, I, th I think maybe the, uh, sometimes I get the impression that the assumption is that I haven't been thinking about this for 10 years. I've been thinking about this for 10 years and you know, well, boy, you're just getting around to doing it now. Yeah, I am for multiple reasons. A, I've never had a really compelling reason to do it because for most of those 10 years, I haven't been doing the kind of production in here I'm doing now. Uh, and for, for the time that I wanted to do it, I've just been too busy in the shop here to actually take this out of commission for the time it takes to do it. And I've wanted to get some other projects done first. So it's been kind of a, a process. Uh, there's always expenses and you know, you can stretch those expenses out over time, all those reasons, but I definitely have been constructing this, um, in concept for most of 10 years now. Uh, so that's kind of the reasoning there. Uh, yeah, blowing that outside is not going to work in this uh, situation. It's just not going to work for those reasons given. And I really appreciate all the suggestions, particularly to that effect, because that is the best solution. Get this dust outside, right? That is absolutely the best solution for my lungs. Get this dust outside and for the building. I mean, there's dust on everything in here, um, but that's secondary. Uh, the, you know, the long and short of it is 
that's not going to work. If I had, I have a building that's not insulated, no ceiling, you know, then I can, I'm obviously in a climate where I can leave the doors and windows open and, and provide that makeup air to move that 600 or more CFM outside. Um, you know, ideally, I think I would have a system where I can change this over from blowing the, the, the exhaust of the blower uh, into the filter or outside. I think that would be best case because then I do work in here when the weather's warmer. So then I can open the door, you know, block it open, change this over to blow outside, work here all day long and all of the dust is going outside. Uh, that's best case. And I just have not built that in here uh, for this. Uh, most of my work happens in the winter, so it wouldn't be very often that I'm able to actually blow it outside. So, yeah, uh, heating the building. Uh, I would not be able to heat this building that fast. And um, even if I could, it would cost me probably $1,000 a month to heat this building that fast. Probably more than that, because uh, it costs plenty to heat this building to start with. And so those are all the reasons, uh, particularly that I don't uh, uh, duct this all outside instead of trying to filter it. I would love to. Uh, that's absolutely the best scenario. I'll, I don't have to clean the garbage cans, put it in a bag, haul it out, do whatever. Um, you know, Tom's got a little trailer he uses. Boy, that's a slick setup. I would love that. Put a trailer out there, hook that to the tractor, drag it out back and tip it off into the swamp or something. You know, uh, that would be so nice. Um, that's not going to work because it's just too cold. So let's get this, uh, let's get this shop back out of the way and, uh, get this system hooked back up to the table. So I'll see if we can make a difference. I want to finish the plywood today. Uh, so at least I've got that out of my way. So you can see here yesterday's work, uh, there's 40, 40 pallet pieces on each of those. And then I've got... I've got uh, these to go. And then these are offcuts. Some of them are from last year, actually. And a lot of those will be cut up. Well, at least some of them will be cut up for 11-inch covers. I call them 11-inch covers. I don't know why. They're the six-frame nuke covers. So I have to make some of those for myself and some for another customer. Uh, so I'm going to be cutting up a few of those. And then the rest of those can actually be cut uh, it's you know 16 and i don't know up to 17 for 10 frame covers because i'm building uh i'm building 200 of those 10 frame covers that's actually exactly the job i did in uh november uh last fall is 200 of those covers so we could see that that took me a month to do that so i gotta get cracking here um february is coming up to half over i've got a convention coming up which is going to take most of a week out of my work and uh, got to make some tracks here. It's Monday, February 12th, 2024. Now I've been cutting up plywood all afternoon yesterday and I've just started in today. Um, so far today, I've been just getting ready for another trip to Winnipeg tomorrow. Uh, arranging orders in the truck, getting things squared away, um, preparing the empty jars and whatnot that I need to take in to the packer to have filled and whatnot, and, and deciding how I want it packed. I've got a number of different SKUs and I, I have to juggle my inventory and figure out what I want to have on hand. And I also have to meet uh, their needs or their abilities um, it's a small plant, so they can only do so many pounds of creamed, so many pounds of liquid uh, at a time. And, well, they can only do so many pounds of creamed at a time. They could pack all the liquid honey I want pretty much, you know, within reason. But I think they do about uh, three, they're three or four hundred pounds of creamed. And then the rest is uh, liquid pack. And the, the total amount is about 600 pounds. So it ends up being just a little more than half creamed each each time. 
So anyway, uh, you can see that I got my dust collector hooked up here without the cyclone, uh, and that's fine. Uh, I actually connected my my separator bucket here, and if if you hadn't seen the other videos, this bucket just has a just has an elbow inside that directs the debris to the side so that it doesn't just go right up the pipe again and it actually works really well um, you know going through the bother and expense for the cyclone may not buy me a whole lot but I think it is going to work better than this so then I've got that plumbed into the, the pipe on the table saw here and that's working really well that's working really well I've got the bag has got a little bit in it but but a lot of what comes into the bag uh, comes off of this filter. You know, I can bang on a filter and get some of that really fine dust out of it. There's a kind of a scraper thing that you can turn around, but I can't reach it. <laughs> I need to put a longer handle or something. Uh, I have to get the ladder in order to reach that uh, at this point. So, but this is working great. Show you that handle that's way up here. Way up here, this just goes around and around, and there's there's things that uh, flip the inside of that pleated filter. And you can see I've got a ratchet strap holding this thing down. This is to compensate for this crappy King Canada design. These little screws here, there's four of them that screw in to the housing. They're just a friction fit on the housing, but they're not a friction fit because they don't go in far enough to actually grip the housing. Uh, so when you start the dust collector, this filter goes up about a quarter of an inch and then all the dust just blows out underneath it. I think it's blowing out here, even at that. So it's just a crappy design. That's, that's King Canada. It's kind of, they make, they make just about everything you need to use, but it's probably the best of the worst. And it's pretty bad at that. Oh well. So you can see the, the pallet wood that I've cut up here. And so that, you know, that'll wait for quite a while until I get all of the other pieces milled up and get into assembly. And then I got into cutting off cuts. So what I've done here is, uh, if you recall, See these pieces, these pieces are kind of the center of those plywood. I cut the, the pallet part off of one end and off of the other end. And then this was left in between. Um, I cut a number of those up into 11 inch strips for, uh, for six frame covers. And then I'm cutting these up into uh, 16 and, you know, oversized 16 and 5 eighths. So, 16 and 7 eighths or so uh, for 10 frame covers and this is the this is again this is an off cut so I can get I get three of the 10 frame covers uh, cut out of that um, left over and then I can get one that's that's not as wide as a 10 but it'll make a it'll make a six that's 14 inches I need just over 11 so uh, it'll make a little strip. I don't know that I'll use that for anything. It may just make firewood. So this uh, D-grade plywood I got, you know, uh, it's, yeah, it's not beautiful stuff, but I think it's good enough. Um, there are some delaminations, which I will cull out as we go. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of it's, most of it's pretty decent. Most of it's, uh, you know, laminate pretty good there's some voids but again you know this is a void here i'm going to have a four inch strip here not four three inch strip here so i'll cut that off this side and hopefully i'll get rid of most of that void and maybe not but again i need to cut this to length yet so i can maybe just sip that right off so you just work around it there's going to be a lot of waste uh, but i think the final product is going to be just fine so a number of these off cuts the the center of the plywood parts I've already cut into 11 inch covers here um, and that makes up most of what I need for my covers 
and uh, I, I'm I'm going to have a lot of a lot of pieces left over because I've got a lot of these these end pieces after cutting the uh, 10 frame cover parts, and this is just 10 frame covers uh, using up uh, offcuts. You know, I haven't even got into the pile to cut 10 frame covers specifically. I'll have 30, I'll have over 30 covers here. Um, you know, 30, 35 covers here. And you know, that'll go a long way. I need 200 covers though. So I'm still going to get into a lot of plywood. So I have the parts on order for the, the cyclone to put that together. And you know, it's one of those projects where you kind of start into it and you the farther you get into it, the more you regret starting it. I'll use it. I think it'll work well. Uh, it'll, it'll make my system more, um, compact and, and built together sort of thing than, than bags and garbage cans and, you know, the dust collector was on wheels and it's always moving around. This is just going to be an installation, which is what I wanted to begin with. Uh, so that's, that's how that's going, but I'm glad I got that hooked up because now I can use a table saw and the separator still works quite well. I've got two more things I can do here. Cut all of these 10 frame covers and now I've got all these blanks that are, are wider and longer than a six frame cover, but that length is kind of waste. There's not much I can do with it. Uh, but what we can do is we can set this now at 11 and I want to run 11 and a quarter. And the thing, <laughs> the thing I forgot is I've got a, a thin kerf blade in here. And I'm actually running without my riving knife right now. A little bit more dangerous without the riving knife, but if you're careful not to pinch the wood on the back of the blade, uh, you know, you can still make safe cuts sheet stock isn't so bad if you're if you're ripping lumber then that's when that's you know more likely to cause a problem but you should run your riving knife in i'll tell you that don't do what i do and so what i was going to say about the uh blade because the the arbor and the saw is this side and you mount the blade on the width of the blade will affect the size of your material as indicated on the fence here. So all of my pallets are a sixteenth of an inch too long. Not quite a sixteenth maybe. <laughs> That's going to bother me. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to fix it. <laughs> it's a lot of cutting to fix that. Uh, so there's a problem here that I have to solve. It's not a huge, huge problem. And I think I'm going to solve it after I, after I cut these to width. And that problem is because I used the track saw to cut these off cuts out of the center of the sheets, this, this line is not necessarily square with this line. So that's a little bit more tricky. What you have to do is you have to run that through the saw this way with a, with a square miter gauge on there, which I have one and that's what I'll end up doing. So I'm going to cut this off and then I'm going to kind of demonstrate that for you how, how I'm going to do that. I won't do them right away, uh, but I'll just show you one.
This is a very high quality miter gauge I bought last year. I really like it. Uh, it's very accurate and it's easily adjustable and repeatable. So you can, if you go off square for any reason, um, you can just adjust it right back to square really easily. It sits right in the miter slot there. I've adjusted it so there's no play in it. And now what I have to do is I don't need the stop for this. I need to square one end of this with this so I can bring this right out. It's a little goofy that all of the adjustments are, are uh, you need this Allen screwdriver thing. But that's okay, it works. Works very well. So it's immaterial how much I cut off here. And see that the difficulty is always, it pulls back off of the table. By the time I get the workpiece, this side of the blade, I can back the blade up a little bit if I lower it, but not much. So that's kind of my problem. See, it moves down there and uh, is difficult. So what you can also do uh, with this one, I can't do it as much. I would have to completely reconfigure this to do it, but you can also take your miter gauge and turn it around and run it in the other way. I don't move my fence and everything, so you can run it, that in the other way, um, but you have to get your miter gauge this side of the blade. So you can start, you can start your miter gauge there, put your workpiece here, and run it through the saw that way. There's not, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. To do that, I think I would have to clear this all away and get the miter gauge in this slot um, and work work on the right side of the blade, uh, which I might do. I'm going to cut all these to width first, and then I'll decide which way I want to approach that. You just witnessed the evaporation of $120. So I think I know exactly what happened here. Um, that was the brake activation. So you can see the blade is gone. The blade is gone and the stock shuts off immediately. Uh, this piece had some delamination. And so, you know, for the price of trying to fix this, I could have bought about four entire sheets of plywood. So that's pretty disgusting. And what happened was yesterday before I left the shop, I, I spread out the, the crack in the plywood and I put some glue down in there and I screwed it shut. I left that sit for a long time. The glue inside there is not dry. And that has just uh, ended my day. And it looks like tomorrow when I go to Winnipeg, I'll be stopping at Lee Valley to hand them another 120 bucks for a break. Um, it actually doesn't end my day because I have a break that I can use. It's a demonstration break. The saw will only run for about two minutes. I have to keep restarting the saw so I can use that today. But I'll show you how this goes. So I might not even need two wrenches because it's, it's when that goes off, it really uh, sticks everything together. The blade and the brake become one, and it can be very difficult to remove. I can see this one might be fine because the blade just uh, 
wobbled a little bit on there. Yeah, this is gonna work. I think I have to get the brake come out of there. I do have way more experience with this than I uh, care to admit. And I have to raise the arbor. The arbor on this is on a, a breakaway detent system. And so I need to raise that arbor. Uh, the blade is hitting the dust, uh, the dust shroud. Just try to not cut myself. Oh, you can see that. So this is what happened. This extremely long, uh, strong spring keeps tension on a on a hair trigger inside there, and this big capacitor here. I believe this is what happens. This big capacitor is charged up, and when the system senses something touch the blade it the capacitor discharges through that hair wire burning it off and this spring then charges the brake into the blade so it's a it's a destructive thing the br the brake is no good now and that's the part that's going to cost me over 100 bucks but you know that's what you that's what you get for I don't know. I don't know if I can blame myself for being so careless. I did leave that a long time to dry, but obviously not long enough. I could have. I kind of didn't even think of that because I could have turned the saw into bypass mode and and just avoided this altogether. So usually the blade is hooped. Um, or at least something that you shouldn't use. So we'll see what it looks like. It's not really, it kind of really went in the side of the brake here. So yeah, it's cleaned a couple of teeth off. Fortunately, this was a really cheap blade. See, it's uh, taken that tooth off and that tooth off. So that blade is total junk now. And, you know, a good shop might be able to repair that. However, you know, it's a $10 blade. So I don't think I would bother. You can see the destruction in that. That's aluminum. The blade, because that blade is thin, uh, it's not very heavy. So this break, uh, you could see it's uh, deformed here a little bit. But I've had it go off with a heavier blade, and this deforms dramatically and pushes this part right back into here. So that's interesting how that that happened and because the blade was so thin when it hit the brake it actually deflected over this way and bent the blade over that way yeah so it's interesting to uh, you know it's interesting to see how that works and it's expensive to see it work this is my demonstration brake so it's exactly the same thing, but it's the kind of brake that's used uh, at trade shows and stuff. I forget where I got that. And so I'll put that in and the saw will, again, it'll only run for a couple of minutes. So I'll cut a few pieces, shut the saw down and start it up again. And it's, it's a pain, but 
you know, I'm not dead in the water right now. And thankfully, I did that before I went to town. And hopefully Lee Valley has a new brake for me. I'm sure they do. <laughs> they probably sell a lot of these things. All right, we need a new blade. So I cleaned out the discount bin at the local hardware store last last year. And I've got some brand new blades here. I think I was paying, I don't know, $15 a blade or something. I think I want this 32 tooth. Um, that's a 60 tooth. I don't know if that's necessary. 32 cuts nice and fast because it ejects chips really nicely. That one was even more aggressive. That was probably only a 40 tooth blade. Oh, I forgot. So you have to pull this arbor up. It's kind of loose in there. You have to pull it up at a quite a sharp yank to make it lock in. Kind of like that. Now this looks like a thin blade as well. The thin blades are nice because you can, when I, when I go to cut all of those, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small parts out of the, the one by eights. There's a lot of ripping involved. So you lose a lot in the kerf. So the thin blade is nice. Sometimes the thin blade will make the difference of getting one more piece out of that stock. I think that's about the same kerf as the other blade I was using. So I don't use that. Now I can, I can cut this, uh, but I just need to run the saw in bypass mode. And that means the blade is, uh, the blade break is not active. There's something to be said for cheap blades. My blades I usually buy are and the order is 60 to $80. And I can have those resharpened a number of times. I don't know how many, but I've sharpened them quite a few times. And it cost me $20 for the shop to uh, sharpen that blade. Well, I'm buying this brand new thin curve blade for 15. So it's just disposable. I'll just buy that, use it till it's dull and then throw it in the garbage, which, you know, a disposable world is not very good, but it's economics, right? Okay. Yeah, that's exactly the same curve. I can feel that glue is tacky in the middle there. So that was a silly thing for me to do. Oh well. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is Lee Valley has them in stock. I can pick that up tomorrow when I go. Bad news is every time I need a break, it's gone up by $20. I remember the first one I bought was, you know, in the 90s somewhere, $95 or something. And the next one I bought was 120 and uh, it's 140 now. So, so there you go. You've been witness to a $140 break and a $15 blade disappearing just like that. Now, I don't think I have any more of that, that stuff to cut. Okay, so I'm just going to cut these in 11 and a quarter for my six frame covers. And that shouldn't take me too long. It's 
since the pieces I'm cutting are all of the same width, I'm going to use my feather board. Keeps the material to the fence and it also gives me a little bit of kickback protection because these fingers are angled and it doesn't, you can't move the material back against the fingers very easily. So that's what I'm left with. People ask me quite a bit, well, can't you use that for a, a shim on the pallet or a runner or something? You can, um, but as you can see, plywood delaminates pretty easily, especially after it ages. And another thing I'll show you is that a lot of the, the problems with this plywood show up on the edge of the sheet. So it's nice to be able to cut uh, kind of out of the center of the sheet and get the get those edges cut off. I mean these are the only two that are like that in that whole stack so it's actually you know it's not that bad. You lose some but it's not really that bad. And that bit with the glue and, and the and the break that's unfortunate because that's you know, a lot of the money I was trying to save with this plywood has now gone down the toilet. It's a good illustration. You know, throwing good money after bad. For my next trick, I want to run a consistent square edge. I want to take my miter gauge and run this through to make this edge nice and square. <coughs> These are pretty square. But I do I do make my covers fit quite quite tightly. So I don't want them being out of square at all. Put my riving knife in for this because this is where things could go sideways and the fact that I'm not using the rip fence uh, negates that problem that I have. I didn't explain that the riving knife is a little bit thicker than this thin blade so when I cut it I rip something it'll go through the saw and then it binds a little bit between the riving knife and the fence. Not a lot. I, I expect it so I know I can deal with it. Okay, so now that that's a little shorter, I can barely get between there and the blade. You know, still not ideal, but it'll work. Now that was easy on the 11 inch covers, however, I need to do that to all of these, all these big covers. So that might require turning the miter gauge around as I described, but before I do that, I'm going to size these to length. And I'm going to cross cut on the table saw, which is not the best idea. Okay, I have to remember that this is my square end. So I need to bring this across and cross cut it like so. It's a little, little dicey. Um, typically you don't want to cross cut things that are real narrow because that gives them the opportunity to twist in here and bind on the blade and it can really kick and be dangerous. 
so typically, I don't know what the rule is. This I feel I can do safely. I have a riving knife. So if the, if the workpiece twists this way, it will have a very hard time getting into contact with the back of the blade here. But you need to be careful uh, if you're doing this. You have a saw that doesn't have a riving knife. If you're not as experienced, don't do this. I've got a nice sharp blade, so I don't have to give much uh, pressure to push the piece through. I'm going to measure this because well, I've got it just about right. There's 20 and an eighth. I want these. No, I don't want it. I want it to be 20 and 5 eighths. Because I want a half an inch for my for my rabbits. I think I'm gonna leave that right there. Okay. So we cross cut these. Yesterday, I ended up with a whole bunch of similar offcuts. I took the time to make shiplap out of them so that I could glue and screw them together and make, make covers. Uh, I'm not sure I want to bother with that. It takes three of these little pieces to make a cover. You know, I'll probably stick these out back somewhere and maybe someday if I want that sort of thing, I can use those because I have probably more than I need here now. And uh, it's kind of a waste of time to do that. And as we could see, sometimes when you try too hard, you end up wasting more money instead of salvaging stuff. It's Friday, February 16, 2024. This week really flew by. And that's partly because uh, I was out kind of late on Tuesday, but not just that I was out late. Uh, it was a long, long day on Tuesday. I went to Winnipeg, did a bunch of deliveries and had a good day. And then had a B club meeting in the evening that went well, we did some business, had a great presentation, and always nice to talk to people and rub shoulders with fellow beekeepers. And then I was uh, kind of dragging on Wednesday and even Thursday. Uh, Wednesday, I, I just kind of worked in here a while. I got the new, the new break on the table saw, I installed that, and I didn't really do a whole lot more work though on that. Um, I worked at uh, getting some orders ready for Thursday because then I went on Thursday. I did my northern stores uh, on Thursday and, and some nice invoices Thursday as well. So it was a really good week for deliveries. Very happy about that. So I look forward to those uh, coming in. <laughs> Most of my uh, stores, they're, they're really good paying invoices, so I never worry. And uh, uh, some of them actually pay them before they're due, which is great. 
Now, Friday, um, I'm still, you know, getting honey ready because every time my process is my, my, my supply chain, you know, the whole process between extracting to the customer uh, has a lot of stages. And, and every time I'm selling honey to stores, particularly because they sell by the box, it's a box of 12 jars, uh, then, then I've got to replace that with another box of 12 jars out of my inventory. Uh, so Tuesday, of course, I took 600 pounds more honey into the packer and I picked up the honey that they had packed for me the previous week. And so that's kind of what I'm doing here today. Um, this is the, some of the honey that I picked up. Isn't that beautiful? That's just gorgeous honey this year. That's, uh, that's my out yard honey. And this is also, this is also the same. This is exactly the same honey and yeah, creamed. So is that something how different the color is? And something new, I did have years ago, I had some squeeze bottles, but they, were, they weren't, they were one pound squeeze bottles and I need 500 gram squeeze bottles. So I just sourced those. And so now I have a, a 500 gram squeeze bottle and that's the same honey as well. So that's really great. I have a lot of customers who were waiting on those. And this is my, so those I've all showed you, those are all my 500 gram jars. So that's um, a pound is, is 454 grams. So pound isn't quite 500 grams. And this is my one kg. So that's just a little more than two pounds of honey. So that's actually the same honey as well. So you can see how nice and Nice and white that honey is, it's just beautiful. This year, you know, 2016, I think was, I think the nicest honey that I've made, um, that the bees made, that I produced, I suppose you could say. And this year is right up there. It's, it's really nice. Uh, so I'm just here labeling jars. Now, um, 600 pounds of honey comes in and you have to sit and label the jars. So I'll kind of show you how I'm doing that. It's pretty low tech. Um, to get specific, the jars always have, because they're a molded jar, they always have a very light seam on the side. You really don't hardly see it. However, if you put the label over top that seam, you maybe see kind of a bubble or something in the label. I like those seams to be on the sides. And there are some some little uh, protrusions here, some little dots. They almost seem like braille or something. And I use that as the back of the jar. So I'll set that here. And then I just, uh, I've got my labels in the roll here. Pull the label off and I eyeball it. Sometimes I get it just right and sometimes I don't. That's why I was wearing those glasses. So you can check your work there if the label doesn't line up across there you've got uh, some improvement so this one's pretty good it's not perfect so yeah so that's that's what i'm doing here i labeled all my squeeze bottles and uh, so now i'm into the the half kg uh, liquids and then i've got a few half kg creamed uh, i've got some one kg creamed like this to do and uh, then I actually have some pails too, to, uh, to get labeled. So I just brought all of the honey in here and uh, these are the five kg pails. And these are three kilogram pails. So again, you know, 2.2 is, is, if you're trying to think, well, how many pounds is that? Uh, three kg, that'll be 6.6 .6 pounds. And, 5 kg is 11 pounds. So once they're labeled, once the boxes are labeled, then I, I stick one label on the outside just so I can easily see, is that a box of honey that's not labeled or is this ready to go? And so this honey's ready to go. Uh, I've got my CR for creamed honey so I can see that. Like I can see that on the label, but at a distance I can see that and I label the CR on every side. So when it's in my truck, I can easily see what's what. So I've got large cream, large liquid there. I've got small creamed, and then some more behind it here. 
So I like to bring the creamed honey into the garage after it's creamed. You can see that that's still squishy. So I like to leave it here. It's only about 15 degrees C in here. And I like to leave it in here for at least a week while it just finishes setting up. Then I can take it into cold storage and store it elsewhere. Uh, if it stays frozen, that's great. And some people kind of think it's weird that, you know, you can take a glass jar of honey, you can put it in frozen storage and it's fine. Well, that is the case. It doesn't break the jar just like water would. So you can use that principle to keep your keep your honey from granulating. If you liquefy it, then you freeze it, then it'll stay liquid for a long, long time. So that's what's going on here today. I just want to get this honey labeled and then uh, I can use it for deliveries as the deliveries come in. Um, so I'm already getting orders. I have to go out tomorrow and do some deliveries. Uh, so I've got a delivery for next week as well. Uh, it never stops. <laughs> it's like it's like the post office, you know, it just keeps coming in, which is really great. I'm glad it does. Um, but it is relentless. You've got to be ready for it. If you, you start that ball rolling down the hill, you can't just walk away. Uh, you could, but I feel a responsibility. I feel a responsibility to customers. Customers are phoning me wanting honey. I hate to say no, right? As a customer, I feel that when I I like a product and I get used to using a product and I get into the groove of using a product and then suddenly I can't get that product. That doesn't make me feel good. Um, you know, I'm just a creature of habit really, but still it doesn't, uh, doesn't do much, anything positive for me to have that ripped away from me. So I feel that responsibility to my customers. And if they're going to phone me and order honey, I want to build a deliver. And so I have to make sure I keep that whole supply chain right from, you know, it's all, it's all in the five gallon pails. I have to make sure I keep that chain going from, from there to packing, to labeling, to storing and keeping all that. And I've got a few SKUs now too. Uh, I've got seven, I have seven SKUs for honey. Um, so four, I have two sizes of jars and liquid and cream. So that gives me four. And then I have three sizes of pails, so that gives me seven. But I also do, I don't do liquid as a rule in the pails, but I do do liquid in the pails because people keep asking. So that gives me another three skews, so there's ten. So keeping track of ten skews is, you know, harder than you might think when, when you don't have a beautiful, big, dedicated warehouse for your product. And that may be that may be doubling uh, for the most part because I'm going to be in the future pulling some of my packing in-house. Uh, so I'll be packing my direct sale product in-house. Um, my, I'm, I'm kind of taxing my packer and he's, he's saying, you know, you should pack some of this at home. <laughs> uh, so I'll have to do that. So, so that's instantly going to turn it into 20 SKUs. Right, so I've got those 10 that I talked about and those 10 again in product is I'm gonna have retail product, I'm gonna have wholesale product or direct sale product. Uh, so that's 10 SKUs twice. And that's gonna be taxing to manage the inventory for each one of those SKUs, store each one of those in a decent fashion. Um, yeah, I gotta stay organized. Should be doing more plywood next week. It's been cold, you know. I've I've got to bring 20, uh, probably, I don't know, 20, 25 sheets of plywood in uh, and get it through the table saw for covers. And I'm kind of waiting, is, is why I decided to just do labels today. It has to be done, but uh, today's a good day because it's cold out there. Uh, it was minus 17 when I came out. It was minus 25 C last night. Now, that's not that's cold but it's not really really cold for this area but that's about as cold as it's been this winter um, and and according to the long-term forecast that's as cold as it's going to get <laughs> i'm happy about that 
So I have a couple of fun things to tell you about. Um, this first one, the uh, channel reached to 4,000 subscribers this week. So that's kind of fun. You know, we all like to look at those milestones and nice even round numbers. So I just, I just wanted to thank everybody for subscribing. Um, I still really don't know what people get out of this channel, but you know, I'm happy to do it. I uh, have fun doing it and I like sharing and you know, it's just uh, just just a hobby. So I'm glad you enjoy it. I really appreciate the subscriptions, etc. I like the comments too. Put comments. I really like the comments. Something else to tell you about uh, this uh, weekend. Um, I think it's actually live today, being Friday. Um, Brent Nixon has a podcast so called uh, "Breeding the Honeybee," and he had me actually on the podcast uh, a little while ago. And so that podcast goes live today. And so drop over to his. Um, his uh, Spotify. I'll actually put a, a link in the description, show you where you can find it uh, to listen to that little uh, little podcast. It it was it was quite short. You know how beekeepers are; we can talk forever. Uh, but uh, Brent's a very good interviewer. He's uh, he asks really good questions and he puts his uh, guests at ease. I just felt honored to uh, be part of the podcast, and it was just fun to do. So. Drop over and uh, listen to Brent's channel, his his uh, podcasts. Uh, there, he's got a lot of really interesting guests on his podcast. I've listened to a few, and uh, it's it's going to be one of my favorites now to listen to. So give it a listen. So for now, thanks for watching. Have a really great weekend. Take care and have fun.